previously on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. My name is Katie Aitchison. I'm the co-founder of Numbers and People Synergy, and we're a company that brings big scale data about what's happening in the world together with the experiences of people on the ground. There is a lot to learn from children that we very rarely, I mean, I talk about young people not getting listened to. I mean, I think children are probably (laughs) the most silenced group in our society. And when you really sit and listen to people, the world opens up. It doesn't implode (laughs) or explode. It opens. It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to acknowledge our traditional custodians of country where I live and work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge our continuous connection and contribution to land, sea and community. Today, I'm talking with Kerwin Ray. K-E-R-W-I-N-R-A-E. You'll want to write that down and or start Googling his name. And I'm talking with Cohen because he is an entrepreneur that has one of my most favorite ways of defining entrepreneurship. Do you know what that is? Did you just think mothers? I know I've said that a lot on the show, how I believe mothers are the original entrepreneurs and they are. But this way of defining entrepreneurship, the way Cohen defines it works best for me well because i'm the kind of person that can imagine what it's like to be a mother and draw parallels to entrepreneurship but can't really empathize because well the obvious issue of me not being a mother but this one i like i'm going to stop talking now because cohen has something really important to say my sport's called entrepreneurship and it might sound funny because i've had this conversation a lot lately like to me, I find it really interesting that we can classify um, esports as a sport, which is fine, by the way. But it's essentially someone sitting on a, you know, on a chair um, playing with a joystick, um, and they're prof- they're considered professionals. They have an amateur league and a professional league. Yet we're still waiting for people to classify business as a sport. It has the same level of celebrity that support has. You know, it has in most cases the same level of discipline, same level of competition, if not greater levels of competition. And so for me, that's, uh, yeah, the, the number one sport that I follow is business. Uh, I'm a passionate enthusiast of the sport of business uh, and I'm a passionate coach of teams and a passionate player. Uh, and that to me is, yeah, is the game that, I'm, that I, I really love and, and enjoy a lot. I love that game too. And for you listening, going, what are you going to talk about today, Ronsley? Are you going to draw parallels between sport and entrepreneurship? Yes. Yes, I am. But also, Cohen is going to cover three main types of training required for every entrepreneur. And I'll tell you what the three trainings are. They are performance training, conditional training, and stress training. So that is coming up later in the show. But first, Cohen wanted to remind us all that a fulfilling life is probably key even before the training begins. The sooner we work out why we're here, the more fulfilling life is, you know? Uh, I think there's the two greatest moments you're ever going to have in your life. The first one you're going to be completely oblivious to, that's the day you were born. Although you'll be aware, but you won't remember it. Uh, And the second greatest moment that any person will have in their life is when they actually discover why they were born. You know, and I'm not saying that in a cliche philosophical way that everybody has a destiny, but everyone, you know, every one of us, because we're not, we're not like most other forms of biotech in nature. Like we, we, have, we have these differences that enable us to be able to, you know, channel information and channel ideas and channel, you know, outcomes and purpose that, you know, other, other mammals don't necessarily have. And, you know, every, every single organism, you know, from the single celled up 
they all have a purpose, you know. And if you look at a dog, an ant, uh, you know, a fucking dung beetle, everything has a purpose, you know. And when 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 organisms are aligned with their purpose, okay, they're in flow, they're in function. And when organisms are you know misaligned, you know, they're in dysfunction. In most cases, they're in chaos. You know, and I think one of the reasons that, you know, we do see some chaos where we see is because people just haven't aligned with why they're here. They're not in flow with their purpose. And, you know, the more you can find out why you're here, and here's going to be the hint. It's not going to be what you think it is. It's not to make money, you know, but yes, once you find your purpose and it's not to make money, you can connect it with making money. You can make more than you've ever dreamed of. And it's a lot easier to do it that way. Um, you know, that's one of the things I do with business owners when I'm doing anything with high performance. You know, the first thing I do is I get them clear on why you're here. You know, let's connect you with something bigger than anything you've ever been connected with. Because if you can discover why you're here, then I don't need to motivate you. All I need to do is poke you, prod you, and give you process, you know, and remind you. And that's what a purpose is. It's a motive. It's a grandiose, giant motive, you know, and a motive without action is just, um, you know, it's mental masturbation. A motive, motivation is a motive in action, you know, and our goal is to learn how to make our motive strong enough to create levels of action uh, that compel us to do that consistently at a very high level. A motive without action is just mental masturbation. At this point, you're probably thinking, what is the action, Ronsley? I have no problem taking action, but what do I do? That is to be me. I just knew that I had the will to do stuff, but didn't know what action to take. We will get to that. Like I said, we will go through in depth into the aspects of training for the sport we called entrepreneurship. The most important thing that every athlete needs to know, though, is self-knowledge. It's interesting. When most people go to fix something about their life, they usually do, you know, they'll, they'll usually cut their hair or buy a new set of clothes or, you know, maybe if they've got a bit more financial, you know, clout, they'll buy something bigger. Um, but yeah, I've just found that the key to all of my problems is getting to know myself. And the more I know about myself, the easier it is for me to live with me. And the easier it is for me to get the best performance out of myself because I, I am aware of what my motives are. I'm aware of what my triggers are. I eff- effectively know where my buttons are. And I think when you talk about, you know, especially performance, uh, you've got to understand the tool that you're dealing with. And the more you know the, the racket that you play with, the more you know its grooves and its, its lines, the, the more you can throw it around when it's required. And you know, we are essentially a trillion dollar piece of biotech, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but most people walk around like they're, you know, like they're carrying a shopping bag, you know. And I, I don't think people really fully understand the potential of human technology. And for the most part, it relies undiscovered or unrealized because it has to be discovered. It has to be realized. And that in most cases only comes through search and discovery. Uh, and in most cases, it's not going to ha- happen studying someone else. You might see symptoms, you might see indicators, but the, the, the greatest research project I've ever had is myself. In a study conducted by the authors of How to Become a Better Leader, it was found that self-awareness was regarded as the most important capability for leaders to develop. The reasoning behind this in relation to running a business is that executives need to know where their natural inclinations lie in order to boost them or compensate for them. Let's get the comparison out of the way. The comparison between a professional athlete and an entrepreneur. Professional, by the way, being a key word in that statement. Well, here's the thing. How do you know if you're a professional athlete? Well, two things. Number one, you can play at a level that gets you paid. You know, enough for you to cover yourself and some. And so to me, you know, if you are professional enough about your work okay, and your moral and your ethic to be able to produce income, then you're a professional at your sport. How you would measure your level of, you know, I guess you could say as a professional in the sport would be by basic measures, you know. So on one materialistic side, it could be incomes, it can be revenues, it can be profits, it can be net worths, okay. But then on the other side, it's in terms of impact, you know, how well did you actually play the game? You know, how well did you actually compete? How well did you perform? You know, how well, how consistent were you in your playing styles? Because just like, you know, professional athletes, professional entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, it's a short version for professional athlete in my world. You know, we, um, you know, we, we, we have to, in some cases, fail a lot uh, before we actually start succeeding. And, um, you know, if, if you fail, then you don't eat. And it's the same on the tennis circuit. You know, if you don't have endorsements, 
if you don't have a job and you don't win games, you don't fucking eat. And so for me, um, I don't know. And I think that's honestly one of the things that's missing uh, from this, mate, in the psychology of most entrepreneurs is that athlete mentality, you know, and because when you look at what we do as, an ath- as a business athlete, you know, and then you contrast behaviors uh, and context against a performance athlete. Well, first of all, all performance athletes compete. So do entrepreneurs. All performance athletes train, you know, most entrepreneurs don't. All performance athletes get adequate rest and recovery and know that if they don't get adequate rest and recovery, including nutrition and hydration, they're not going to be able to perform at their best. That's the professional etiquette of that sport, of most forms of sport. You know what I'm saying? And so for me, you know, uh, our job as professional athletes is to become aware of the the things that create variables in our performance, you know, and the more in tune we can become with that, the easier it is to play the game at a higher level. You know, one of the reasons I can do what I do and I can outwork most people in my industry is because I've conditioned myself, I've conditioned my mind, I've conditioned my body, you know, not just through work, you know, through all sorts of training, training with the military, throwing myself out of planes, you know, I've really gone to the ends of the earth to develop a level of resilience that enables me to work at a rate that most people couldn't even dream of. Okay, but it wasn't a button I pushed. It wasn't a program I downloaded. You know, it was training that I did. And by virtue of that training, it enables me to compete at levels that, you know, others can't. And I think that's what's missing. You know, most business owners, number one, they don't train. They're not sharpening the store, the, the store. And number two, they have really shit, less than adequate rest and recovery and self-care. And as a result, you cannot as an athlete, there is no fucking bragging rights for you know, the person who has the greatest level of exhaustion. Recovery and self-care seem like easy things to think about when it comes to the recovery for an athlete. And you've heard me on this show talk about loving ourselves, I suppose, and how important that is. And while I was thinking of that, Cohen started to break down the psychological and physical components of loving oneself. Cohen? Look, I think there's two, there's, there's two components to this conversation. When we talk about loving yourself, you know, you've, um, you've got the psychological component and then you've got the physical component. And for me, one of the things that I've learned when it comes to um, showing yourself love is really understanding the importance of following through on commitments. And I know this is going to sound really strange, but when it comes to people who experience issues around self-worth or a lack of self-worth or they don't love themselves as much, I've seen a very strong correlation between people who feel that way uh, and people who make a lot of commitments that they don't follow through on. And in most cases, they make a lot of commitments to themselves and to others that they don't follow through on. And as a result, they create this unconscious connection that they're not worthy of completion of these commitments. And so they don't follow through. You know, one of the biggest things or practices that I do with people is I get them to start making one commitment a day that they absolutely 100% commit to and then three and then being aware of their micro commitments and then having a like a commitment detox where it's like you can't commit to anything unless you're a thousand percent committed to follow through on it. You know, and so for me, that's an, a massive part of learning how to love yourself is learning to value your own commitment, you know, because again, it's, it's how oftentimes we measure relationship. You know, we measure relationship based on someone's ability to commit you know, commit to us, commit to the boundaries, you know, of, of that, of that container. And to me, if you can't commit to yourself based on the things that you're committing to, then that speaks a lot, you know, especially when it comes to self-love and being able to love self. And the second one around self-care is routines. You know, the way that we show, and everyone's got their own love language, you know, um, but for me, I've found one of the best ways to show myself love is by adopting really healthy self-care routines that I have to prioritize and protect in my schedule that are absolute non-negotiables. And that's, cha- that's one of the big things I've changed this year a lot. Um, you know, because after March, I worked 11 weeks straight, but I, I got to the point where, you know, um, if my week was getting too busy or my day was getting too busy, yoga would get canceled or moved. My personal training would get moved. You know, my sauna would get moved. My meditation would get moved. And then I just started going, you know what, guys? No, because if you keep fucking moving that, this athlete is going to break break down and burn out. And unfortunately, I'm carrying, you know, a lot of people on this team right now. And so I had to step in and start going, no, I'm the fucking priority. And this is, this is big for me because, you know, people, I've got two people that manage my diary and those people, in most cases, they're protecting my time, but at the same time, they're trying to manage relationships, you know, they, and they have to manage expectations. And so for me, you know, um, I had to learn how to get everyone around me 
not to prioritize themselves. <laughs> this is and this is a key thing, right, in a leadership role, because most people will prioritize themselves and, and actually help them understand. I am the priority. Sorry, I should say my self care is the priority, and that can't get moved. And if you have expectations that you need to fulfill based on meetings that you need to set, you have to work all around it because I'm worth the yoga. I'm worth the PT. I'm worth the sauna because do you know why? That's what you do to people you love. You make sure that they get cared for. And if you're not going to care for yourself, especially as a professional athlete, and I'm a 46-year-old professional athlete, you know, I know that there's only so long that I can compete at the levels that I compete at. And I want to be able to you know, sustain that for as long as possible. And so for me, one of the things I realized is burnout is not conducive to long-term consistent performance. And if we start doing what athletes do, which is rest, recover, massage, you know, <laughs> acupuncture, you're a fucking athlete. You're going to get injuries. You know, you might have a bad back. Oh, I've got a bad back from sitting down. Oh man, your sport's tough. Okay, so now you need to go to rehab and get that shit sorted out. When we come back, we go deep into performance training and how physical and psychological characteristics are part of that equation. Our aim with this audio documentary has always been to build a strong community of entrepreneurs and creatives to provide a space where they can use their voice to share their authenticity with the world. As a valued listener, your voice matters too. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. So don't be shy to let us know how we're doing in the ratings and comments. If you have a message for our production team or know someone who would be a perfect fit as a guest, you can find out more information on how to share your input at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. Hey, welcome back. Do you remember I kept talking about training in the first part of the show? Well, I'm just going to recap quickly. We are in this volume drawing parallels between sport and entrepreneurship and vice versa, much like I've been likening it to being a mother in a lot of previous volumes that we've done. And while the world and humanity doesn't really fully appreciate and or comprehend what mothers really, really do, when it comes to sport, the rules are clear and winners and losers are clear too. When it comes to sport, all that I just described is just a wish until you put in the training. And the training is really very specific. Entrepreneurship, well, let's just start with performance training. I think fundamentally, when you look at the training for entrepreneurship, we've got to look at two things. We've got to look at skills and performance. You know, and on the skills side, um, we've really got to look at, you know, what training do people require from a skill set perspective? And in most cases, they're not going to get that from a school. And then on the performance side, you know, what training do they have in the form of conditioning that is going to enable them to perform at a, a, at a higher level? And so for me, when I talk about the training, you know, on the performance side, it's really understanding the psychological training that's required because there is psychological training as far as I'm concerned required if you're going to get into business. Uh, there is physiological training required, you know, because again, the greater efficiency that you have in your physical body, the greater efficiency you're going to have as an entrepreneur. Because again, the, the conduit is more energy, more time. You know, people can't say, oh, I can't create more time. No, but you can't create more time, but you can create more energy. And the way that you create more energy is by looking after the system that you've got so you can actually produce more energy. And so that for me, you know, is a big part of the game of looking after uh, of the system. So I think basic forms of mobility, basic forms of, you know, blood flow, anything that's at a low levels, anaerobic, um, anaerobic, aerobic, I think everyone should be doing some form of training every single day because you're conditioning your body against the stress. When you go to the gym, you're applying stress to your body, okay? Um, and that stress by virtue of it being applied intelligently makes your body stronger. And that is in essence almost metaphoric of what we have to do when we approach business. We have to approach business with a conditioning mindset and go, okay, well, here's one of the things that we know. Business is going to be incredibly stressful. All right. And so our goal is not to run away from stress. Our goal is to expose ourselves to stress, but to do it in intelligent ways with tools so that we can regulate you know, the, the stress in effective and in healthy ways so that we don't respond in unhealthy and ineffective ways that can perhaps lead to greater levels of you know, fatigue and exhaustion. We'll focus on stress training in a few minutes, but before that, conditioning training. And when it comes to conditioning yourself, every other form is useless if the most important one isn't taken care of. The most important voice 
the one inside our heads. I am my toughest critic. There is not one motherfucker on the planet that can be harder on me than I am. Um, and I still am to this day. I'm learning how to build a better relationship with myself when it comes to feedback. But yeah, I do have, um, you know, and I wouldn't say that I'm hard on myself per se. I just deploy consequence really well. I have ridiculously high standards. And as a virtue of that, if those standards aren't met, you know, my goal is to create some form of tension when those standards aren't met so that I can ensure that I meet them the next time, you know, and whether I'm training, you know, a dog or my child or, you know, a talent member or coaching a client or myself, it's, you know, it's the same process essentially. Gowen, let's just get straight into conditioning training. You, you need to be conditioning yourself obviously against a range of things. You know, we're conditioning ourselves against stress. We're also conditioning ourselves against pain. And pain in most cases comes in a range of forms, but most of it is psychological, you know, because in most cases, the things that we think about cause us more pain than the things that we actually are thinking about. It's the thinking process that creates the pain. And so, you know, the psychological training in most cases it's required is learning, is teaching entrepreneurs how to manage their minds, you know, teaching entrepreneurs how to manage their emotions, teaching entrepreneurs how to manage stress from the psychological perspective, okay, because we're balancing out with the physiological conditioning, you know, because we have to psychologically condition just as we have to physiologically condition. You know, we're conditioning the body to stress, exercise, you know, heat, cold, and I don't know, fucking tough arguments at work. You know, but we also want to be conditioning ourselves um, psychologically by looking at those situations and being very conscious of the importance of sitting in the discomforts of what that produces so that we can become essentially um, not numb but just non-reactive, completely responsive, but non-reactive to situations. So our goal is to get to a point where we learn how not to react, okay? Because we are conditioned to the stimulus, okay? Because if you're hearing a loud noise go off every five minutes, you know, you're only going to get the shits get out of you probably the first two or three times. After the first two or three times, you're going to go, yeah, that's just normal. But then someone's going to walk up and go, shit, oh my God, that's get the crap out of me. How do you live with that? It's going, well, I get used to it after a while, you know? And that's what we've got to understand the way we condition ourselves is by getting used to stress, okay? And by psychologically viewing stress in different ways because we have enormous amounts of control of our psychology when it comes to maintaining a label or a perspective or a description for situations, you know? And if we look at situations that are painful, if we look at situations that are stressful and we continue to label them, label them as painful and stressful, they'll continue to roll that cycle of response. Whereas if we can literally psychologically in the moment create a context where we go, I'm going to redefine what this means in a positive way. I'm going to choose what the meaning means because I can see a benefit from this separate from perhaps maybe um, a drawback that's being forced down my face. And I'm going to focus on that because that's going to enable me to maintain what might be greater levels of discomfort because I just don't view it as uncomfortable. Because <clears throat> people sometimes look at me and go, how do you meditate in a really noisy room? I go, that doesn't bother me. Oh, it bothers me. And I say, well, I bet that means you can't meditate in a noisy room. Well, I can. And how do I learn how to meditate in a noisy room? Well, I learn how to meditate in free fall. Because if I can meditate in free fall, I can meditate fucking anywhere. You know, I did a number, over probably a couple dozen jumps with a heart rate monitor strapped around my chest, learning how to meditate in free fall just so I could overcome the, the situation through conditioning. But more importantly, teach my mind that although I might have been falling through the sky at 220 Ks an hour, I was safe. I was secure. And in fact, this was incredibly beneficial for me. And as a result, my body learned how to relax and meditate in free fall. And so when I'm at the back of the room and there's noises blaring and people yelling and people say, how do you meditate? It's like, dude, compared to meditating, falling out of the sky, this is fucking easy, bro. You know, it's all context and conditioning is based on a spectrum of exposure exposure to a stimulus. And as you work up that spectrum and as you conditionally, therapeutically, consciously expose, okay, and pull back, draw back, rest, recover, exposed, pull back, draw back, rest and recover. And this is what we've got to understand about conditioning. Conditioning doesn't happen through continual exposure. That causes erosion. You know, conditioning happens as a result of exposure and then rest and recovery. Exposure, rest and recovery. The athlete model, right? And that's a really important part of the, yeah, the process to remember. Rest and recovery can make a huge difference in an entrepreneur's journey. Although it might be hard to know when to step back and take a break, giving yourself some time to rest could be exactly what you need to take yourself or your business to the next level. In a study from the University of York and the University of Florida, it was found that more than 40% of our creative ideas come during breaks, when we allow our minds to wander or turn off altogether. 
You know, before I arrived in Australia, I thought of stress as the forces being applied to a bridge or a truss, like the stress and strain of opposing forces. Yes, I am an engineer underneath this all. I didn't know people suffered from stress. So when I was first told, hey, Ronsley, I'm stressed, I really didn't know what to make of that statement. Stress for me is a really fascinating application of force. Well, I think when people are stressed, they just, their bodies don't know how to respond, you know? And as a result, they respond the wrong way because they've not been trained or conditioned to any form of stress. Like the first time you climbed, it's probably very different to the last climb you did. You know, the very first skydive I did was incredible because, you know, I had an instructor either side. I had my big fucking student rig on the back and we get to the door and we're at the door and I've got one, one fucking instructor on the wing, another instructor um, in the cabin beside me. They're both holding on and I'm at the door and all of a sudden I'm like, the dude who's on the outside is trying to pull me out. And I thought the dude on the inside was actually holding on to me, but he was actually trying to push me. But in my head, I'm like, why is he holding me? Because I'm trying to get out of the plane and I couldn't get out of the plane. And the guy on the outside is pulling me. The guy on the inside is pushing me. And I'm like, why am I stuck in the plane? And, you know, eventually they wedged me out of the fucking plane with a, you know, with a, a shoe heel. I got down and I went up to the guys and I went up to the guy who was on the inside. I was like, why were you holding me in? And he goes, I wasn't holding you in. He goes, your body was overriding everything. He goes, but I, but, I was like, but I was trying to get out. He goes, it doesn't matter what you think you were doing. Your body was overriding your brain because your body was like, clearly my brain has fucking lost it here. I need to override. <laughs> this, guy, this guy's going to get us killed. He's about to jump out of a fucking plane. And so by virtue of being aware of that, I was like, wow, I actually prevented myself. I almost prevented myself from having an incredible experience. And that's what stress does. You don't know how to respond and adopt to stress in an effective and meaningful ways. In most cases, especially if it's a high level, it'll stop you in your tracks. Did you know your brain can influence your body's reaction to anything? This is a study by Wayne State University. Wayne State University School of Medicine designed a special suit to make people cold. Not because turning people into popsicles is hilarious, but because it's interesting. They could use this special suit to measure the subjects in a PET scan or fMRI to really understand what happens in the body and brain in cold conditions. Specifically, it was an inquiry on Wim Hof's ability to withstand the cold, a man with the ability of increasing body temperature at will and survive under extreme cold conditions. The special cold suit had the ability to be infused with water, so you could run cold or hot water through it and control temperature. All you had to do at this point was slap a few ordinary people in the suit and measure. Over 25 minutes, they would measure skin temperature as they cycled water through the suit from neutral to cold and back. Here's the trend in the control. Nice and wavy between neutral, cold, neutral, cold, neutral. Their skin temperature predictably falling as they were exposed to colder temperatures. After a solid control was established, they asked Wim to undergo the same experiment without any kind of breathing technique. His response was very similar to that of the control. Nice and wavy. They then asked Wim to undergo the same experiment after priming his body with his own breathing and meditation techniques. The result was a sustained skin temperature of 34 degrees over 25 minutes. This is completely out of the ordinary. It's as if Wim just shrugged off the cold. This is also the point where scientists see this and out of excited curiosity stuff Wim into a PET scan and fMRI to see what the hell is happening. Firstly, to see where all this excess heat was coming from in the body using the PET scan. And secondly, to see what was occurring in the brain using the fMRI. So what was happening in the brain during all this? In many ways, the brain is an important player. Usually the brain and body would react unconsciously to the cold. However, in this case, there seems to be a willful subversion of that reaction. Instead of the body preserving heat and regressing, skin temperature jumped up to 34 degrees and his body started expending more energy. Something as primal as cold and heat can be brushed aside by the brain as if it wasn't even there. You know, I hope that over the time we've spent together putting out these volumes of the psychology of entrepreneurship, you listening, I hope that the biggest understanding you get is the first line of what Cohen is about to say. We are our greatest coach. We are, you know, and that's where I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, when it comes to the performance side of, of anything, you know, obviously everyone at a high level, you could say in the sporting profession has a coach. But how many people have actually adopted that responsibility within themselves, you know? Because again, when you look at the coach's role, a co any good coach's role is to help 
motivate, connect, and inspire the, the individual to do more. You know, but if you require a coach, that is a vulnerability. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have coaches. I think everyone, you know, should have a coach in some way, shape, or form, sport, otherwise. But if you can learn how to coach yourself, you now have an unfair advantage because you now have, you know, an internal coach working for you and maybe an external coach working for you as well, you know, which is only going to serve your performance, especially when it comes to understanding the utilization of pressure. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. What a good coach does is a good coach applies pressure because pressure is where we create performance. You know, pressure outside of performance, you know, isn't performance. You know, where we get the greatest level of performance is when you apply, you know, the greatest amounts of skill, timing and pressure. You know, pressure is actually a critical ingredient, but most people don't know how to respond to pressure. And as a result, they can't perform. And when we coach ourselves, we can lead and parent better? It's become so much more about leadership and so much less around control, you know, and understanding the, the leadership dynamic between a child and a parent is probably one of the most incredible opportunities for you know, communication, for development, for coaching, you know, it really is a precious, precious relationship. And so for me, as someone who is just so geared towards performance and coaching, having a child for me has been the greatest experience of my life because it's like my, I've gone from having my number one client being me and now my number one client is my son. And I say, he's already, you know, he's seven years of age, but he's had easily a couple million dollars worth of coaching and it reflects in his ability to perform. Uh, And so for me, it's taught me an enormous amount about um, patience, an enormous amount about the resilience and the relentlessness that's required when it comes to leadership. You know, it's like, and again, some people may not like the, the, the comparison. It's like training a dog. Like when you're trying to train a dog and you're putting a correction in place, you might have to put that correction in place a hundred times, 150, 200 times, you know, over a week or two weeks, it could be thousands of times before that behavior sticks. And the same is true when you're coaching a child, when you're training a child, you know, we can't expect children to learn things quickly necessarily all the time, you know, and that's where we've got to understand slowing things down to a level that helps people learn is essentially what the communication is all about, especially in a, you know, in, in, in a in, in a child parent scenario. And because whenever I'm, as an example, whenever I'm trying to discipline my child, uh, my son or, or my daughter, I'm not trying to make him wrong. I'm trying to make him think. And so, you know, the same, I've learned how to do the same processes with my team. Whenever I'm disciplining a team member, my goal isn't to make them wrong, it's to make them feel bad. It's to make them think. And because that's obviously a good skill of leadership is teaching people how to think independently for themselves. So they fundamentally can make the biggest strategic decisions without you. You know, he's learned how to become independent through strong leadership. And that's what strong leadership does. It creates independence. And so I'm learning this through being a parent. And then I'm starting to go, oh, okay, I need to foster greater levels of independence. How do I do that? Well, I have to be a little bit more patient when it comes to helping people adopt the lessons that they're taking and realize that, you know, um, not that it's my way, but yelling and screaming, it's just ineffective. You know, you might get people afraid and they might behave, you know, differently short term, but it's not going to create lasting change, you know, especially in a positive way. There is no denying that Cohen has achieved a lot of really amazing success, both internally and externally. The drive, I suppose, is always for the pursuit of freedom, for the pursuit of expression, for the pursuit of impact, for the pursuit of legacy. And well, while I was thinking all this, instead of me supposing, I thought I'd ask him. Yeah, I think the reason everyone gets into business you know, on some level is very similar. You know, some people will say it's money, or but I think fundamentally one of the re- biggest reasons that people get into business is because they want a greater sense of autonomy and freedom. Um, and I know for me, that's one of the reasons I got into business. And so for me, you know, when I first got into business, I think like many other business owners, I didn't see a lot of freedom in hiring people because then I had to look after somebody. <laughs> and that to me is not free. And again, it depends on the industry and the business that you're in. And so for me, I still remember trying to do everything for such a long period of time because I wanted to stay streamlined. I wanted to stay easy. And again, uh, in, depending on the context and the education business. But as I started to scale, I started to realize that, you know, without me willing, and I think every business owner goes through this at some point, without my willingness to step back, there's no way that we could scale up, you know. And we're even at the, and it's so interesting how that conversation over 20 years has evolved to the point now where, you know, even now, it's only now after 20 years do I feel I've got the team in place, the leadership in place, the structures in place where I can go, you know what? Next year, I think I'm going to take a couple months off. And maybe not necessarily all in one go, but I'm going to be more orientated and more focused on putting and allowing the business to work under management rather than under my management. Psychology of entrepreneurship.
coming up on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I am Rachel Luna, the host of the Permission to Offend podcast, creator of the Faith Activated Journaling Experience, and the founder of the Confidence Activated Live event. Well, in order to be successful, you really have to have courage because it takes a lot of courage to do anything that we're doing in the online space. Like marketing takes courage. So equal means everybody has the same thing. Equity means everyone has what they need. And we need to make sure that everyone is getting what they need to thrive. I interviewed Cohen Ray because he has consulted in 11 countries and in over 154 different industries. He has taught over 100,000 people uh, the world over through his seminars and workshops. He has coached thousands of consultants and coaches in numerous countries on business development, marketing, sales, human behavior, and entrepreneurial psychology. Kerwin has also worked with high school and university students and the general public. He is the author of The Entrepreneurial Apprentice, a training system, uh, and the co-author of one of the best-selling series, Secrets of Marketing, Experts Exposed. He is a businessman, an entrepreneur, investor, and international speaker. He is one of Australia's leading business strategists, helping business owners succeed for over a decade. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kaylee Bonnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research by Jenna Elliott. Content by Corinne Castles. Project managed by the legend that is Kaylee Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and way to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Love the polished audio docu-series style of this podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship? At We Are Podcast, you can learn how to create a similar style for your own show. This revolutionary virtual event assembles podcasters, entrepreneurs, and marketers in one spot, so you're able to learn from the masters. Head straight to wearepodcast.com to reserve your spot at our next event.